I, you know, I'm studying this book of Hebrews that we're in. We're going to be in chapter 3 if you want to go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be looking at the first six verses. And there's so much in this book that is so wonderful. Um, you know, as I was looking at starting this book, I was excited about looking at it. And I was just kind of surveying it as I got ready to make my decision. Do we want to go, do I want to go and start doing some lessons from it? And, and it just started really getting me more and more motivated as I looked at it. And this week again, as I was studying for this chapter here, these first six verses, it, it just came to me. And I kept, I kept wanting to know, why, why was this book? What, what is it that gets me excited? Why is it so wonderful to me? And I think that as I was growing as a Christian, there's several concepts in this book that help me to relate to them in a better way and very encouraging. And it, it really helped to relate to me, not even being a Hebrew. And when I first read this book, I had no clue necessarily all the things that I know now about how you've got to be a, a Hebrew to fully appreciate some of the logic that he's using and all that flow. Just being the Gentile that I am and being able to listen to this word and get so uplifted and encouraged in my spiritual life, that just shows you what he will also describe as the power of the word of God. So as we've gone through this book, let's put ourselves again. I'm going to keep doing this because it is important for us to try to remind ourselves. Is it who is he writing it to? He's writing it to Jews, people that are focused on the knowledge of Mosaic law. They are two types that he's probably writing to. And there's a third one, and that's us Gentiles that are probably listening to this letter when it was being read aloud and passed around. But the first is a Jew who has not accepted this Messiah, this idea that this man, Jesus. And that's what I want you to think about as you hear, and he does this tonight when we look at these verses, he's going to just use his name, Jesus. It's just like saying Ron, kind of casual, huh? Instead of Mr. Herring. And so he relates, and he's doing this as he's going along. Why? Well, to those in that century, when they were reading this, if you were a Jew that did not know anything about this messianic stuff, and he was God this, in, this, you know, in the flesh, you wouldn't know this much. Historically, there was this man, and he was a Nazarene, and that he was a rabbi a prophet and man he could do some stuff and they actually kind of said that this guy could do some miracle stuff and so you would have a familiarity because the scuttle around all of the synagogues would have been about this guy named jesus but now have you as a jew who know so much about the old law have been raised with all of the great things of the mosaic law accepted him as the messiah that the law talked about the christ that the law talked about. The one in which you should be looking for. The one in which as a little bitty kid that you were taught, there's going to be this king come. There's going to be this Messiah come. But is it this man? Is it this man? So from that perspective of a Jew who has no real belief and hasn't become a Christian that's listening, then the writer needs to be able to articulate in a very logical manner how that a Jew can accept him and not just because, just, well, because. And he does it so magnificently. He's already started out talking about how God has spoken various times in various ways in the beginning. And now that was through what? That was an old way. That was through the prophet. But now, he says, he speaks through Jesus. And then he goes on and builds up in the first chapter about how superior he is to all these other things that were so endeared to the Jew. So he's starting to crack that egg a little and say, look, you know that God used to talk through the prophets. And you probably at least, even if you don't think he's God, you have to admit, he probably was a rabbi and he probably was a prophet. They could accept that much. So he's got him. He's kind of got him. He's like, okay, you know what? You're right. Okay, I can accept him as a prophet. So now he starts out that way. He says, look, this is how God used to talk to the prophets. Guess who he speaks through to now? A prophet, but his name is Jesus. And then he brings passages that they would be so familiar with and showing 
that these passages that you grew up with were talking about this one person. And that he's greater than angels. He's greater than all these other things in which you have. And it's not to insult you as a Jew, but to help encourage you to see the beauty of the fulfillment. Not the insulting of it, destruction of it, but the fulfillment of it. And so he started out with showing the great superiority, but then he paused. And kind of when we last week, we looked at this warning about drifting. That be careful. Now he's turning back to the Jew who's listening to this that is a Christian who their entire life followed Mosaic law, that that's all they've known. Remember, this was a theocracy. So everything about their lives, their government, their retirement, their families were tied to their religion. You know, we have today families that where one family member has forsaken that belief system and the family turns their back on them. We know that. Well, try to be a Jew and turn your back on Moses. <laughs> So there's some key words that he's using to help bring them along in his logic so he can help support them and not get them inflamed and upset. And he started out with something common. We know how God talks. We know how he did. How this one now is greater. You know he did some miracles because you've heard some scuttle about it. But he's even greater than angels. There is some ideas that traditionally they had this, they had this kind of angel worship. You know, they, they had this greater value of, of angels, even just above Moses, which we don't understand that, do we? We wouldn't have saw that if it wouldn't have been through all these other studies of looking at the culture at that time. And so you go, why does he bring in angels? Who, do, who cares? Well, to the Jew that's listening to this, it does, because it means something. To him, an angel was something great. Now he says he's greater than angels, but he was made for a little while, a little bit lower. Than the angels. And then he says, and to which angel did he ever say that you're going to have dominion? Which angel did he ever say, today I have created you as my son? To which angel has he ever said? I'm, and he, he brings those up and they're sitting there going, you know, that, that, that passage does exist. He's using that passage appropriate. That, that makes sense. Okay, okay. And then he, then he comes to the Christian like, don't drift. It's very dangerous. Hold fast to what you know. And so now we come to six. And I think this is kind of be confident. Be confident. But in this, even though we're going to end with that verse of the idea of being confident, he has to still continue the logical buildup for the Jewish people listening on why he's still greater. Now he's going to get really kind of walking on eggshells. He's cracked that egg and now the shells are laid out. And now he's going to touch Moses. The holy creator of everything for them was Moses. You don't, don't run down Moses. But now he's going to. And so that's what he starts and he's going to do that. So let's just read one through six and we'll come back and then we'll make some comments and we'll, I'll bring out some points about it. So. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in, God's, in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more glory, more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a, as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So there's three things that you could sum up that he's going to show about the superiority of Jesus. The first one is superiority of office versus Moses. And I mean, in other words, his role of what he was going to do. Why? Because he's both apostle and a priest. Moses wasn't a priest. He was an apostle. He was a prophet. The second thing that he brings out in these verses is he's superior in his work. He's the builder of the house. He's not the one that lived in the house. He's the creator. 
The third thing is superior in his person, who he was. There's a difference he compares between the servant and the son. And so that's, if you were to stop, we were to stop right there. That's what he's talking about. Three things of superiority that he shows here. So now you come back to verse 1, and he starts with this word, therefore. Now we know in English, and I'm terrible at grammar, but I do know at least this much, that when I read something that says, therefore, or whether, wherefore, you're talking about something that's already been spoken about. So what is it? Because sometimes, now I don't know about you, but I'm slow, and so sometimes when I hit those therefores, I have to go, okay, okay I just read that, but okay, what was it? So what is it that he was saying that he's now saying, okay, because of this, because, and then he's going to move to what he just said, but he says, because, one, he's greater than angels. He's also the captain of our salvation. He just said that he's also a sanctifier. He sets us apart. He said he calls us brothers. He was made like us. And he says because he destroyed Satan and the fear of death and he set us free from bondage. So because of that, pay attention. Because that's kind of what he does. It's like because of all of that, if he's that great, now let's talk about him, and he's going to move in to talk about Moses. Now, something that he uses here, and it's not casual, when he says, holy brethren, or brothers and sisters, and he there says a relationship and describes something very special. One holy. Now, holy is a very, for, for the average Christian, you know, when you try to say, are you holy? Do you feel like you're holy? I don't. I, I don't. When somebody goes, you know, if somebody walked up and said, Ma, you know, you're holy, I think they're being a smart aleck. Because why? We always hear people throw it at us and say, oh, so you think you're holier than thou, huh? And so we have this nasty thought of one, we don't want to be like that because when we say that somebody is holy, we think they're, you know, arrogant and looking down on everybody else. Or we also then think, that is something at God level. But we have to look at what that word is talking about, and it's not a word that we should shy away from. It's a word that we should honor and that we should take because that same word has a root that deals with saint, that we are referred to over and over again, that we are a saint, we are holy, we are set apart, we are unique, we are different, we are not the same as the world. That alone is something we could claim to be, right? Doesn't mean we're perfect. Holy does not equal perfection. Holy describes a relationship, a unique situation and condition in which you hold. And by being a Christian, you are different. You are other. We don't know what it is. We don't understand all the things about God and stuff, but there's something about it that we are not the same as the world. So we are set differently. The brothers and sisters, now he is speaking specifically to the Hebrews who have become Christians. So what do they have here? Now, if you're a Jew, what do you have in common with all the other Jews and all the other Hebrews? I'm using those interchangeably, by the way. If you hear me say Jew or I say Hebrew, I'm, I'm meaning the same. Jew is not being derogatory. It's a short for Judah, the tribe, and they got that after they came back from captivity, and so they get called Jew like that. So I may use that interchangeably, so please, if I say Hebrew or Jew, I'm using them the same. So to a Jew or a Hebrew, when you say brother, that indicates something, the relationship you have, that you share in. What is the biggest one you share in? Abraham. Bloodline. Genealogy. You also not only share in that, but you share in a relationship, in a unique covenant relationship through Moses. So that's why we're brothers, because we are born in the bloodline and we share. That's what they share. And they, in a sense as well, were holy. They were set apart. 
So this can be both him saying to the Jew, but honing it in seems to be in this context, looking at this is a special. We haven't given that up as Christians. You may be a Christian now, but you're still holy and you're still brethren. You're still brothers and sisters. And so he says, therefore, because of all these great things, holy brothers and sisters. Why? What ties us together? He says it's a heavenly calling. What tied the Hebrews and the Jews together? It was Mosaic law. It was very physical. It was a very physical promise. It was a land promise. It was, it was a nation promise. It was things in which were very physical that you could see. But not so for the Christian. The Christian had a unique relationship. And so here he says that it's a heavenly place. Which throughout the New Testament and all the writings of the apostles, we see this strong inference of the idea that this kingdom which fulfills what Daniel talked about in saying that there would be this last kingdom that would come that would be built from something very supernatural because that hand comes from nowhere and destroys everything and it would be everlasting and it would not be passed down generation to generation. You see, Israel, that nation, was passed down generation to generation from king to king to king to king. And what happened? All sorts of trouble. All the time. There was always problems with this corruption or that corruption. So the promises, even the promises that you may have had, were corruptible. So if you're a Jew and you're sitting there going, yeah, wait a minute. I'm, I'm a Jew and I'm of the tribe of, of Judah. And I have these inherited land promises. And I have these things in which I'm supposed to have. But you're being corrupted by priests that, that are sinful and selfish. You're, you're seeing that the very promises that were physical are being affected by men. So that's another great thing about ours. Man cannot mess this up. Because it's not in a dimension in which they can touch. So we share something in a heavenly calling. The Apostle Paul talks about it in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 in there. But in here he says, Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Spiritual blessings, not a physical blessing. Not a land promise or something like that. An inheritance from your family, your riches, your goats and sheep. No. This is something that we share, but it's a spiritual sharing. So now he says something that's very powerful. Now, depending on what translation that you're using, um, ESV, King James, they say they use this word consider. But if you look at the Greek and see that when I say, well, why don't you consider buying this car? Why don't you consider taking this trip? I'm not, what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to pause for a minute and evaluate. So if I said, well, why, why don't you consider buying a Dodge Diesel Ram 350? Well, Gary would be sold. He'd, he'd take that in a heartbeat. He loves Ram and Dodge and all that. But I might have to get you to think about it. So what are you going to do? You're going to stop. Now, what did he say? Therefore, all those wonderful things, do what? Consider. It also, now, the NIV has some of the things that it has that I'm not real fond about. But one of the things that I did like was the way the NIV says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Because that's really what the writer is saying. I just told you how great he is. Therefore, brothers and sisters, with a heavenly spiritual blessing that we have, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Because hold on, get in your upright position, because now we're going to talk about him and Moses. <laughs> and that's going to be touchy for the Jew who's sitting there listening to this conversation. So I think the idea that when he says, consider, really it's stronger. He wants them to stop and just calm down and think about. And you notice he says, Jesus. He doesn't say Jesus Christ. He doesn't say the Messiah. He doesn't say Christ. So what is he saying to them? Now, again, we've been so far removed from all of this. 
that we just think Jesus, first name, Christ, last name. We say Jesus Christ all the time. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, blah, blah, blah. We say it all the time. And if I just say Jesus, you would go, oh, that's the Christ, right? Yeah. But if you're a Hebrew and you're listening to it, he's just a man. So he's, that's why he says that. Now, you notice, I don't know if you caught it, but you will. We'll bring it out at the last of this thought. He then says, Christ. He's got to take these readers from the idea that how all has been laid out by God in a superior way, but now focus in on this one man, this Jesus. And now he starts to get to build up the idea of the relationship comparison between Moses and this man, Jesus. They're both men, right? So now how can I make you, if you're just going to accept him as a man, I got to show you, okay, let's just say you don't quite grasp that he's God, even though he did say that because he said he built everything. I got to build you up that this man was as great, but he's greater than Moses. <laughs> what? Yeah. Why? Well, like we said before, superiority in his office. Because he was not only an apostle, an apostle, which is an ambassador. Moses was an ambassador for God. Jesus is an ambassador for God. Everything that he said, remember how many times did he keep saying, I'm not doing this of my own accord. I'm not saying what I want to say. I'm saying and doing everything exactly the way the Father wants it. It's not Jesus, me. It's the Father. That's the perfect ambassador. I bet you governments would love to have an ambassador like that. How many times? I don't know, because I've never been a nation leader. That your ambassador, you got a call and went, oh, did he say that? Really? Did my ambassador just walk into the, the Chinese uh, uh, president and say that in front of the Chinese president? Oh, man, I told you we shouldn't have picked that guy. Why? Because he's a man. He, he can't know. But this one, this Jesus perfect couldn't get you can't get a better ambassador now think about that apostle moses that he's going to bring up he's going to bring him into this conversation so was he perfect no <laughs> didn't he kill somebody an egyptian didn't he have like a temper didn't he do a few things eh. God told him to, how to bring water forward, and he didn't get that right. He didn't really represent, but not Jesus. Jesus is the perfect ambassador. But that's okay. You know, we can accept that. But now you're starting to stretch the limits here when you now tie an apostle and priesthood. And you know what the Hebrew is thinking immediately? What's his genealogy? What tribe is this guy from? Judah. Okay, stop right there. Can't. What type of priest is this? Well, he's going to have to deal with this later. But he's showing the difference because they know absolutely without a doubt Moses was not a priest. He was a prophet and he was an ambassador and he was an amazing man. But he was not a priest. He could not be a priest. So now he's introduced and flaming the thoughts. Hmm, <laughs> okay, I, you got me. He was somebody very important. But now you're trying to show me that now you're dabbling on the religious side. Now you're bringing in the priesthood. And so I can see him getting a little uncomfortable. The Hebrew going, wait a minute, he's from the tribe of Judah. How could he be priest? We're talking, now we're talking, well, because it was very important to them, that idea. Now the next part when he talks about this house... Now, I, I, if you look and we go, look at there, how many times he uses the word house. House. And he takes both of them without just coming out and insulting them and saying, there's no way you could compare Moses to Jesus. Jesus was just amazing. What does he do? He brings them to something that's common. Because Jesus was still a Jew. And he was still a part of a house. And it was a house that as well he was faithful in. 
And he elevates Moses and both of them by saying they were both faithful. He says they were both faithful in God's house. And then he gets a little closer. So we have to ask the question, what is God's house? When we think about it, well, to the, most, to the Jews, the house was the nation of Israel. It was everybody that was a part of that. Those who were proselyted into it, they were a part of the nation. That was the house. The house, we're probably more familiar kind of with the house of David. That was kind of a term that was used as well, inferring that that's a part of God's household. Because it's hard because sometimes when we hear the word house, we think of an address, a physical building. But it's really household. They were faithful in the household. Those identified as one unique grouping. And so when we say God's house, to the Jew, it was a mosaic law. Those had that relationship. To the Christian, it's our relationship in Christ. But it's still God's house. And so he compares then. Paul talks about in Ephesians 2.19, he brings up, he says that so long, so now then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens, relationship, and with the saints, holy, set apart, right? And members of the household of God. Peter also talks about the cornerstone, that Jesus is the cornerstone, and we are living stones that are building what? Building up the house. So we have a house. We're not tearing it down for the Jew to say, you know, you're getting rid of everything. No, it's all God's house. God upgraded, serious upgrade. <laughs> he took and fulfilled what he said he was going to do. He told you, if you had to look at the prophets, and that's what I've been showing you, he said, you're going to get a big upgrade to that house. You're going to go from, you know, the tabernacle and worldly things that could be corrupted to this magnificent house, but it's still one house. Everybody that's in the household of God, whether you were a Jew under the old law or you're a Christian under, you're under his house. It's his house. So they were both faithful, but now he starts to really start to get in and start to point out there's still something different. There's a difference in their roles because Jesus is great, worthy of greater honor than Moses, the man. Notice he says Jesus again. He's keeping it on the earthly level, not throwing any title, supernatural title on him. He's saying this man is greater than that man. They both men were faithful in the same house, but there's something different. And he brings out the idea that one built the house. The other was a servant of that house, which is greater. Now, you're still maybe struggling as a Hebrew listening and going, I don't know, but you're right. If one of them is a son, the other one was a servant. So they can't wiggle too far away from that. They might be getting uncomfortable, but they have to admit God is the builder. That's why in the parentheses, I don't know about your translation, it says, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Remember earlier in chapter 1, he pointed out the prophecies and the things pointing to Jesus about how it was given to him. Everything was given to him. So if you were reading this in a continuous flow, not breaking it up every Sunday afternoon, you'd start to feel this consistency here about how this Jesus is so much greater. And why? That now he's brought it out and talking about the family. Now he's talking about the family, the household. But one's greater. One was greater. Why? One was a servant in the house. And now this is another relationship that they very clearly understood was the difference between a servant and a son. Now, I can't even really afford to pay somebody to come clean my house, you know, and come over. And they would work for me. You know, I mean, when they do, the few times, I, in a way, they're the servant in my house and they're doing work for me. But in the Jewish culture, that was very clear. 
no matter how long you served, and they treated him really well, and a lot of the servants were very much integrated into the family unit, you're still a servant. Doesn't matter. I don't care how much I love you. We've ever heard this? Blood's thicker than water. <laughs> Family's thicker than servants. So they understood as soon as he said that, whoa, you just put Moses into a servant. And now you're bringing the Christ. This is where he then pops over and springs it in. And he says, and you cannot deny. Now this is a title that you may start to go, okay, the man, the man, I'm struggling with bringing him along. And yes, he's greater and all this. He's done these great things. But then, but the Christ, whether you hook the man with the title, you have to say, yes, whoever it is, that Christ concept that I was taught since a wee little person would be greater than Moses in the house. Because he would be a far greater one. And what's he been telling them? Jesus, Jesus. And then, boom! The Christ. Because why? Christ is the Son. He just put it in. He just opened that up. And then... He brings it home to those that are Christians listening to this that may be pulling back a little bit that were Jewish because of persecutions and pressures and stuff. And now he gives them a warning and tells them, he says, we are his house. We're a part of that upgrade. We're a part of that great new, and I'm, I don't mean to belittling it, but we're part of this great spiritual household. We, he says. Like what Peter said, living stone. Just like what Paul said. You know, we see this. He says, but what? F. It's a big F, isn't it? What does that mean? I remember growing up, my parents used to use that word all the time to get me to obey. That word right there would get me and my brothers to do things that we never thought we would do. That word F. You know what I mean? If you'll clean your room... You can go outside and play. If you will mow the grass, you can go to the movies. If. So. He's showing it's conditional. You are a part of his house. If. You remain confident. I looked at this idea of confidence and it's so closely tied to faith. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing God's word. And if you believe, do you not then have some confidence in it? And when we waver in our confidence, we waver in our faith. And so there's a, there's a part I see kind of him saying, in your faith, in your confidence, that's what keeps us in that house. So now he's a little bit slid towards those Christian Jews and helping them to say, look, all those whatever, therefores, and now you have just told you, Christian Jew, how wonderful that he's the apostle and he's a priest and how he is the son, not a servant in this house, and you are a part of that house. If you remain confident and not just that, but look at what he ends it with. He says as well, holding fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Not just our hope, boasting. What do you, what do you think about when you, somebody boasts? Can't get him to shut up, can you? <laughs> we just keep boasting and blah, blah, blah. You know, do, you, do we do that? Do we boast enough? You know, I thought about that and I thought, where did our boasting go? What happened to us sometimes? Me, I guess, mainly. But I thought that was so amazing. Hold fast. We hold fast to our confidence and our boasting of our hope. They used to boast about their hope to the point where they allowed persecution to be inflicted on them, to have their households raided, and they endured through it. With that type of confidence, they were sealed and protected but they're starting to show some pulling back. And that's why he weaves this in so brilliantly. So whether you're a Jew or not, 
Whether you're 2,000 years removed, this is an amazing, wonderful, encouraging aspect of what we talked about, isn't it? And we're going to go on, because now he's going to talk about rest, something we can all need more of, especially when we have daylight saving time changing, and you need that rest. So he's going to now bring it to the next point that we'll get to next. No, we won't. I won't be here next week. But I hope that you will read this book. Enjoy it. It's going to do so much for your relationship and encourage you and build you up. And I hope you'll get as excited as I am about it. And so I'm looking forward to the next lesson, and I hope that you have enjoyed this. If you're with us this evening and there's something that we can do to help you in your relationship with Jesus and our Father, I hope that you'll take this moment while we're singing this song to evaluate your life. If you need to make a change, please, please do it while we still have chance, while you still have a chance. Let's think about these things while we sing.